The release of Super Mario 64 in 1996 signaled the start of a new age of video game design. While polygon-based 3D graphics weren't exactly new, the Nintendo 64's flagship title demonstrated just how far developer creativity and ingenuity could go with the added dimension. Among the game developers who recognized this was Square's Tetsuya Nomura, who had become positively enraptured with the game and wanted to develop a title that would follow in its footsteps. But when he would discuss such a prospect with his colleagues, they would dismiss it out of hand, attributing its immediate success to the popularity of Mario himself. Doing it from scratch with an original character wouldn't be feasible, they said, with one of them going so far as to say that it would only be possible if he used characters as popular as Disney's. Little did they know that this innocuous comment would prove to be much truer than they thought, as within a few years, Nomura would be spearheading just such a project, bringing the worlds of Disney and Square together for a brand new title, which would capture the hearts of millions all over the world. For a time in the 1990s, one of Square's offices in Tokyo was in the same building as a branch of Disney Interactive, and it was this close proximity which would lead to a seemingly inevitable meeting between one of Square's producers, Shinji Hashimoto, and a Disney executive in an elevator. It was during this brief window that the Disney executive would suggest that the two companies collaborate on a game together, an invitation to which Hashimoto was quite receptive. He would occasionally meet with Disney representatives to discuss ideas for what the project should be, with Final Fantasy creator Hironobu Sakaguchi attending at least one such meeting as well. Initially, talks seemed to be going nowhere, and it was during these early stages when Tetsuya Nomura would be called into an unrelated meeting with Hashimoto and Sakaguchi, who were discussing their most recent talks with Disney as he entered the room. Despite what one may expect given Disney's massive popularity in Japan, Nomura hadn't grown up with the House of Mouse. Having been raised in a small village in the Kochi Prefecture, much of his youth was spent either drawing or outside playing in the rice fields, rather than watching one of the two channels available on local television. It wouldn't be until after he had joined Square in the early 1990s that he would have his first encounter with one of the Disney Company's seminal animated features, The Little Mermaid, on one of those two TV channels available in his childhood home. Needless to say, given later events, he was quite taken with it, and would seek out other works in the Disney animated canon, with Simba from The Lion King becoming his personal favorite Disney character. Upon learning that a collaboration with Disney was in the works, Nomura recalled the dismissive remarks from his colleagues about the game he wanted to make, one which would embody the same feeling of freedom and exploration as Super Mario 64. The only way you could do it is with characters that are as well known as Disney's. That comment had stayed with Nomura for over two years, through the development of Final Fantasies 7 and 8, and now here he was, in the same room where his superiors were mulling over exactly the opportunity he had dreamed about for so long. In an instant, Nomura raised his hand and interjected, I want to be a part of this. Hashimoto and Sakaguchi agreed to let Nomura take charge of the project, and what followed was a meeting with Disney executives comprised of several presentations for what they wanted the game to be. Nomura, however, already had a loose idea for the kind of game he wanted to make, a 3D action game with stylized characters, with a story about the immaterial bonds between people, and from his perspective, it seemed that the people at Disney Interactive had a very different idea of collaboration than he did. Quote, of course, they had their own ideas and asked us if we'd be interested in making a variety of their ideas into a game. They appeared to believe that we would make whatever they wanted us to make, and came up with rather specific requests such as, we'd like the game to feature this character. They were really excited, explaining their ideas. 
To be honest, though, I wasn't really interested in any of them. End quote. With roughly half of their meeting already monopolized by such pitches, Nomura would abruptly stop one of them when he coldly declared, I won't make such games. The Disney suits were stunned by this unexpected response, though Nomura, not being able to understand what they were saying among themselves in English, was unconcerned. Instead, he would explain to them his own rudimentary concept for what he envisioned for the game, a group of brand new Disney characters gallivanting through multiple Disney worlds. The executive who initially broached the collaboration idea was amenable to the proposal, and offered his own suggestion. Since it's stylized, it would be best if there are Disney characters that are known worldwide. Following the completion of Final Fantasy VIII, Nomura would begin planning this new title in earnest as its director and character designer, spending approximately one year as effectively a one-man team. And it was this prospect which had initially given him pause to take on the project in the first place, as he knew how strenuous the task would be. Until now, he had largely been a character and monster designer, with the occasional narrative contribution. But now he was in charge of not just creating original characters, ones which would fit into the Disney brand no less, but crafting the world, conflict, narrative, themes, and other concepts that would bring the game and its story to life. But before these wider considerations, he began with what he already knew intuitively. Character design. In his first meeting with Disney after pitching his vision for the game, he presented them with what he had in mind for the protagonist, a bestial, lion-tailed boy with baggy clothes carrying a sword made to resemble a chainsaw. The Disney executives were, once again, taken aback, prompting Nomura to revise this design. These revisions began with one simple directive from Disney, a necessity behind defeating enemies. From this, Nomura came up with the idea of a key which could free stolen hearts, and so the chainsaw sword would be replaced by what would come to be called the Keyblade, around which the rest of the game's concepts would take shape. A conflict between light and darkness, which sees the protagonist, a 14-year-old boy named Sora, teaming up with Donald Duck and Goofy to find their missing king, Sora's missing friends, Riku and Kairi, and stop the shadowy creatures known as the Heartless from devouring the hearts of people and worlds, using the Keyblade to seal the hearts of the worlds they discover along their journey. This story would culminate in a climactic battle against the evil witch controlling the Heartless from her hollow keep. It was a simple story befitting the often black-and-white nature of Disney's own in-house works, but Nomura would flesh out certain aspects of this narrative on the advice of Hironobu Sakaguchi. When Nomura told the Final Fantasy creator what he had planned, Sakaguchi felt that having such an elementary story would be a bad idea, and that Nomura should craft a scenario which could appeal to Final Fantasy fans. As Nomura toiled away on character designs and story concepts, he would begin assembling a team of trustworthy developers and creatives to handle the finer details and begin greasing the wheels on the project. Among them would be animation director Tatsuyo Kondo, who had previously been a character animator on Final Fantasy VII and a creature modeler on Parasite Eve, battle director Yuichi Kanemori, who had held the same role on Parasite Eve 2, and scenario writers Jun Akiyama, who had also worked on Final Fantasy VII as an event planner, and Daisuke Watanabe, the scenario writer for Threads of Fate. Shinji Hashimoto would serve as the game's producer, and while Hironobu Sakaguchi would ultimately receive an executive producer credit in the final game, this would be for entirely ceremonial purposes as Vice President of Square. Aside from the one piece of advice he gave to Nomura early on, Sakaguchi had no involvement in the project. Rather, his time and focus were dominated by the production of a computer-animated Final Fantasy feature film and Final Fantasy IX, both of which were being produced at Square USA's Hawaii branch, but those are stories for another time. Incidentally, however, Sora's character design would shed its animalistic traits over time so as to not overlap with Zidane Tribal of Final Fantasy IX. While Disney were mostly hands-off regarding the overall plot and scope of the game, with the only stipulation that characters from bespoke stories couldn't cross paths or leave their own world, there were still significant development hurdles to overcome. The largest of these was the burgeoning crew's inexperience with creating games with real-time action combat, which led to a fair amount of anxiety among the team. Some of them were unsure whether the game they were making was even going to be any good, but Nomura would continuously reassure them all that the game would be fun in the end. And yet, the first-time director was facing his own struggles all the while, having to learn how to best manage a project based on what he had learned working under Hironobu Sakaguchi, Yoshinori Kitase, Hiroyuki Ito, and Tetsuya Takahashi over the years. 
Nomura had enjoyed working with and for each of them, and while he believed that he could never be like his seniors, he still hoped to create a working environment that could foster a similar sentiment. He wanted his team to enjoy working for him, even as he struggled to convey his ideas in writing, opting instead to communicate them through his drawings and sketches. Even still, Nomura would occasionally fall behind schedule with his artwork, leading to some sticky situations along the way. But through it all, he maintained a healthy optimism about the project. When faced against the notoriously brand-conscious Walt Disney Company, he held no reservations regarding whether or not something would be approved for inclusion. No matter how bold an idea, if he wanted to include it, he would pitch it with the mindset that, quote, there was nothing that couldn't be persuaded. After all, the project itself seemed impossible even in the most abstract sense. They were already beyond the pale, so why not push further? Of course, certain ideas would have to be reeled back a bit, but even with these concessions, Nomura would still end up coming away from the negotiating table with a victory, if even a small one, every time. There was still the matter of the title, however. Initially, Nomura wanted to evoke the idea of Disney. Offhand, he recalled the then most recent addition to the Walt Disney World Resort, Animal Kingdom, and decided on Kingdom as the title. Unfortunately, the name was unavailable to use, but Nomura was undeterred. He looked toward the game itself and what was at the center of its orbit, the hearts of people and worlds, and combined the two to get the final title, Kingdom Hearts. With its story, characters, core conceit, and now title pinned down, Kingdom Hearts was finally taking shape as more staff were onboarded to the project going into the year 2000. And both Square and Disney were confident enough in the project to formally announce their collaboration early that year. Unfortunately, their confidence wouldn't be quite so readily reciprocated. On Friday, February 18th, 2000, the day before the PlayStation Festival, Square and Disney Interactive held a press conference to announce that they would be collaborating on a unique and compelling game that would be released for the PlayStation 2 in winter 2001 in Japan and fall 2002 in North America and Europe. Disney Interactive president Jan Smith boasted about how it would be, quote, revolutionary in game design, content, and gameplay for a worldwide mass-market audience, and how Square was chosen as their partner in this venture because of the success of the Final Fantasy series and Tetsuya Nomura's artistry. Nomura himself would state that the game was an action RPG set in the Disney universe, featuring his own original Disney character at the center of it. The game itself, however, wasn't shown in any capacity. Rather, members of the press were treated to a tech demo of a 3D animated Goofy moving around and tossing a ball, which Colin Williamson, reporting for IGN, referred to as underwhelming. The general response was mixed between dismissal and genuine intrigue. On the one hand, why would Square, who were so lauded for their ability to tell mature complex stories while pushing technical boundaries, partner up with Disney, who were infamous for their child-friendly squeaky clean image? But on the other hand, both companies had stables of strong creative talents, so perhaps this project could prove to be something worthwhile. But for over a year afterward, both companies would remain tight-lipped about the project, not giving away even a single modicum of information about the game's title or status. On Square's end, development was moving along at a fair pace, with composer Yoko Shimomura, who was already well known for her work at Capcom, joining the project in the midst of a pregnancy. She was so engaged with working on the game's score that she would often neglect to rest until mere hours before the birth of her daughter, after which she would rest for just two months before continuing her work. Kazushige Nojima, who had directed Bahamut Lagoon and written Final Fantasy VII, VIII, and X, would also eventually be brought in to write the final act of the story. But unbeknownst to Nomura and his team, the approvals process at the Walt Disney Company was not as cut and dry as it had appeared. Despite the countless meetings and negotiations held with Disney Interactive Japan, and the extensive development that had been done, Kingdom Hearts had never been granted formal approval by Disney. 
Nobody at DIJ had the authority to give the green light to a project that seemed to fly in the face of so many of the corporation's guidelines regarding creating new characters and settings, to say nothing of there being no precedence for bringing so many disparate franchises together into a single work, nor an official style guide for rendering their characters in 3D. All of this would be found out by Disney Interactive's new Vice President and Managing Director for Asia Pacific, Shuji Utsumi, upon joining the company in October 2000. He was astonished when he was told that, despite this lack of approval, the game was deep in development, and was advised by longtime staff at the company to cancel the project entirely, as getting formal approval for it would have been impossible. But rather than kowtow to their dismissal, even if it was born of institutional wisdom, Utsumi instead sought to at least try to gain approval for the game, and early in his time with the company, the perfect opportunity would present itself as Michael Eisner, the chairman and CEO of the entire Walt Disney Company, the executive often credited with revitalizing Disney as a brand and market force during his tenure, would soon be visiting Japan. Accompanied by then-president and chief operating officer Bob Iger, Eisner sat before over a hundred managers from the US and Japan cultivating an atmosphere that was surprisingly more akin to a Japanese business meeting than an American one. Everyone's focus was centered squarely on him. Every word, every motion, every twitch, taken in with quiet awe in an attempt to gauge his mood, leading Utsumi to likening Eisner's presence to that of an ancient Chinese emperor with how he commanded attention with such little effort. Utsumi had been able to work Kingdom Hearts into his presentation for Eisner, and his division was thankfully in good standing thanks to recent successes in the territory. Ahead of this meeting, he had already met with several of his superiors, including the head of brand management, in order to ensure that this most important meeting would go smoothly. When presented with the project, Eisner didn't have much to say about it in terms of praise, but he said enough to clear the air on the matter. Keep at it and do it right. With those simple words of encouragement, any anxieties that DIJ had about the project were immediately assuaged. The Emperor had spoken. This strange and unprecedented venture for Disney was now official. And soon enough, they and Square would be ready to properly unveil what exactly it was they had been collaborating on at E3 2001. Unlike when the collaboration was first announced with sparse details, the response from the game's press at E3 was fairly positive, eyeing up Kingdom Hearts as a game that seemed like it could appeal not just to fans of Square and Disney, but to entirely new players as well. The anticipation would begin to strengthen after the exhibition of a playable demo at that autumn's Tokyo Game Show, with IGN's David Smith joyfully comparing its real-time gameplay to Threads of Fate and Ocarina of Time, while also praising not just the visuals but the 3D renditions of the Disney characters, and the independent PlayStation magazine considered it to be one of the best games at TGS, with it being a close second behind Xenosaga in terms of RPGs at the show. As the game's Japanese release grew closer, having been pushed back from winter 2001 to March 2002, the Western games press began to grow increasingly excited for the game, as more details about the various Disney worlds and characters, as well as some iconic Final Fantasy heroes, began to trickle their way across the Pacific. But while the press were seemingly unanimously abuzz over the game, their readers were much more divided. I believe that the people at Square and Disney are geniuses. Man, think of how it's gonna be at Disney World. There better not be a squall. I will be so mad to see him in the same game as Mickey Mouse. I think the game looks awesome. I mean, having Donald on your side. I stopped watching cartoons years ago, and I don't remember Donald Duck running around killing bosses. Bottom line is, I don't think this will work out. When I first saw Kingdom Hearts, I thought to myself, Square and Disney? What are these guys thinking? Then I got to know more about it, and I think it looks great. That's just wrong. Goofy and Squall don't go together. At first, I was really skeptical. When I finally saw the game in action, I was very impressed. 
I couldn't care less about the Square Disney crossover. I'm never buying Kingdom Hearts. It just looks lame. There was a very clear resentment from a fair number of readers, those hardcore players, who saw Kingdom Hearts as a misguided children's game, a notion which outlets such as Electronic Gaming Monthly attempted to mitigate in their coverage of the game as its Western release drew ever closer. But animosity aside, Kingdom Hearts would be facing stiff competition on store shelves that holiday season, with other highly anticipated titles such as Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4, Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus, Burnout 2, Ratchet and Clank, and Grand Theft Auto Vice City all slated to release for the PlayStation 2 as well in the weeks to follow. Kingdom Hearts would ultimately have to prove itself worthy of its studio's pedigree in the Western world, when it would finally make its North American debut on September 17th, 2002. There's a certain serenity to starting Kingdom Hearts for the first time. The main menu is stripped down and straightforward, with a white backdrop adorned with the game's logo and artwork of the protagonist, Sora, looking out from the shoreline while set to the sound of waves crashing ashore and a simple piano piece, Dearly Beloved. The opening FMV, set to a dance-pop remix of the game's main theme, leads into a tutorial sequence contextualized as a strange recurring dream of Sora's, where he's told that he's the one who will face an oncoming darkness and open the door. Afterward, he awakens on the shore of his island home, which he and his friends, Kairi and Riku, are preparing to leave in search of other worlds. But the night before they plan to set sail on their raft, a terrible storm brings a horde of dark, shadowy creatures to the island, the same creatures from Sora's dreams. Creatures he can't hurt with his wooden sword. He finds Riku, who's resolute that this is their opportunity to leave their home and see the outside world, unafraid of the darkness engulfing him. But before Sora is swallowed up as well, a mystical weapon called the Keyblade appears in his hand to ward the darkness away and allow him to fight back against the shadowy monsters. He quickly finds Kairi as well, but she seemingly disappears when the mysterious door standing in the island's secluded cave violently opens. Sora's island is consumed by the darkness, but he finds himself safe and sound in the unfamiliar world of Traverse Town, where those lucky enough to escape their darkness-stricken worlds end up. There he meets a man named Leon, who explains that those dark creatures, the Heartless, are descending upon the disparate worlds in an effort to consume them and grow their legions. As the chosen wielder of the Keyblade, Sora must prevent this from happening by sealing the keyhole of each world, preventing the Heartless from consuming it. To accomplish this, he teams up with Donald, Duck, and Goofy, who were advised to find and stick with the wielder of the Keyblade by their missing king, who took off without warning to find a way to stop the Heartless. Sora is ready to walk the path laid out before him, but in addition to sealing the keyholes, finding the king, and defeating the Heartless, he's also searching for Riku and Kairi, whose fates after the loss of their world are unknown. So begins Kingdom Hearts. It's a simple story that's easy to follow the whole way through, as Sora, Donald, and Goofy traipse across various Disney worlds, meet new friends, stop the Heartless or corresponding Disney villain or both from finding the world's keyhole, and then sealing it. The structure may sound repetitive when described like that, but each world's individual plot ties back into the greater narrative in some way. The most apparent connections are most of the Disney villains, who, aside from the Queen of Hearts in Wonderland and Clayton the Hunter in Deep Jungle, are all in league with Maleficent from Sleeping Beauty, who's been orchestrating the Heartless plot. Defeating them thins out the ranks of this council of villains, bringing the trio closer to Maleficent herself and stopping her plans, and they're not completely ignorant of Sora or the Keyblade at any point in the story either. They're all fully aware that he, Donald, and Goofy are trying to foil their plot and regularly keep tabs on them. This is one of several elements which gives the story momentum, as letting the player know that their actions are affecting the villain's plans encourages them to keep going, even if Maleficent remains as confident as ever. She She's slowly gathering the seven princesses of heart to open the door, and she and her allies even manage to pluck a couple of them out from under Sora's nose. It's remarkable how similar the general plot of the final game is to Tetsuya Nomura's original concept, 
The differences primarily lie in various minor details, such as the mysterious hooded figure that Sora briefly encounters in the secret place on his island, originally popping up a bit more often to share cryptic information. At one point, he was going to appear in Traverse Town in place of Leon to tell Sora, Donald, and Goofy about the Heartless, and their connection to Sora's island being destroyed, as well as the King's disappearance. At another point, he was meant to be a resident of Destiny Islands. Like his inspiration, the robed Sephiroth clones from Final Fantasy Seven, his sparse presence adds an element of mystique to the story which likely weren't as present in Nomura's original concept. Sora himself isn't a particularly difficult character to grasp. He's a 14-year-old kid who's lived on an island for his entire life with his best friend Riku, never even really considering the possibility of there being other worlds beyond the Destiny Islands until Kairi appeared on the night of a meteor shower when they were all kids. She knows she's not from here, but she has no recollection of her own world. This instilled a curiosity in the boys, Riku especially, which they wouldn't be able to pursue until now, and so curled the monkey's paw. Sora is kind, inquisitive, naive, and confident. He's quick to make friends with the people he meets in his travels and is always sympathetic to whatever problems they may have. Despite Donald and Goofy telling him that they shouldn't get involved in the matters of other worlds, he is always prepared to insert himself into local affairs whenever there's trouble. He's a fairly uncomplicated hero, and adding to this simplicity is his status as the chosen wielder of the Keyblade. His role as the hero of the story, at least on the surface, is one that is chosen for him. The chosen one trope tends to be used as a crutch to shuffle a story along with as little friction as possible, and the results tend to be milk toast and bland. Rather than someone going on a journey and becoming a hero as a result of them chasing their goals, they're preordained by some arbitrary force to accomplish some great task or stop a villainous plot. They aren't always bad, though. After all, tropes are tools, and whether their use in a story works varies from work to work. Kingdom Hearts is one such case of the Chosen One trope being used well. The Keyblade chose Sora, yes, but he isn't embarking on this adventure purely out of a sense of duty. He was going to try and see other worlds with his friends anyway, Chosen One or not. His personal goal is to find Riku and Kairi after being separated. It just so happens that his status as the Chosen One necessitates that he travels to all these worlds anyway. Unlike Donald and Goofy, however, Sora is given much more to try and piece together in his search. He hallucinates Kairi every so often early on, which isn't much to work from, but it at least gives him hope that she's out there somewhere. Before too long, he doesn't have to hope for Riku, as during a return visit to Traverse Town, he finds the trio and seems perfectly fine. He even got a neat new sword to replace his wooden one, but he vanishes just as quickly as he appears. It turns out that Riku has been taken under Maleficent's care, and she's put it into his head that Sora replaced him and Kairi with Donald and Goofy. This leads him to wanting to find Kairi on his own, and he's willing to ally himself with the villains to do it, even if he doesn't completely trust them. Nonetheless, this still leads to his relationship with Sora growing more antagonistic as the story progresses, despite them sharing the same goal, amplifying Sora's personal stake in the overall conflict. It's a bit similar to Cecil and Kane's relationship in Final Fantasy IV, in that Sora and Riku also grew up together and then clash when the latter falls under the influence of darkness. The details differ, of course, by God do the details differ, but the broad strokes are generally the same. Tetsuya Nomura has even gone on record to say that Riku's character falls more in line with the rest of Square's work than he does with Disney, and I'm inclined to agree with him, but we'll hold off on Riku until we get into spoiler territory. Sora's responsibility as the key bearer, his impulse to help people, and his desire to find his friends all come into conflict with each other at several points. He's a bit reckless, and this recklessness, as King Triton points out in Atlantica, not only draws attention to himself, but brings trouble with him. And his words are given weight because, unlike practically every other local the party meets, Triton is fully aware of what the Keyblade is and the role and responsibility of its wielder. Legends of the Keyblade Master's capacity for bringing peace or devastation in equal measure are even mentioned in the reports written by Ansem, a wise man who was conducting research on the Heartless before he disappeared. Unfortunately, this isn't something that Sora grapples with much in the story. He meddles in local affairs, but rarely lets on that he's from another world, much less that other worlds exist. 
Ariel and, to a lesser extent, Aladdin figure this out through circumstance, but aside from them, the party stay pretty tight-lipped about it. There isn't any sort of direct consequence shown for supposedly upsetting the world order, and one could even assert that the presence of the Heartless already does that to some degree. Sora does get into a tiff with Donald in Deep Jungle because of their different priorities, finding King Mickey versus finding Riku and Kairi, but they've calmed down by the end of the world and it's never brought up again. This indiscretion does, however, fall in line with what makes Sora a strong player character for a video game. He never wavers from his desire to find his friends, even as he continues to forge connections with new ones. It's a grounded motivation for his character that makes him relatable to players of all ages, as well as a solid encapsulation of the story's core theme, that the bonds between people are immaterial and persist regardless of how far apart they are. Sora's dedication to his friends proves this. Even as he and Riku grow further apart, he's still concerned for his friend. He's so endearly committed to his friends, with romantic feelings for Kairi being all but stated when he adds a Paupu fruit to one of their old cave drawings, that we become emotionally invested in his story. We want to find Riku and Kairi because Sora does, and because we've also spent time just hanging around with and getting to know them a bit before their home was destroyed. Of course, this personal investment is also helped by keeping the player in control of Sora the whole time. Being an action RPG, Kingdom Hearts has its large banana shoot feet set in two different, though not incompatible, worlds. Its real-time action gameplay is elegantly intertwined with its RPG elements, and those RPG elements are just deep and varied enough to be fun and interesting, while simple enough for an 8-year-old to grasp. In the triad of Sora, Donald, and Goofy, Donald is the mage, Goofy is the knight, and Sora is basically a red mage. Not because of his shorts, but because of his status as a jack-of-all-trades. He can attack with the Keyblade using a basic three-hit combo, as well as cast magic like Fire, Thunder, and Cure, which he'll learn at certain points throughout the story. He can also summon various Disney characters like Simba, Mushu, and Tinkerbell to help out for a bit in battle, with each summon having their own bespoke abilities. All of these options, as well as using items like potions and ethers and context-sensitive actions, are selected from the ever-present command menu, which is navigated in real time during battles using the directional buttons. This most basic RPG element may seem like a ridiculous design choice for an action game, an impediment to the flow of combat, but that flow is steady enough that navigating the menu doesn't feel like a chore. First of all, you can assign three spells to shortcuts so that you can cast them by holding L1 and the corresponding face button. So if you're in a pinch, you can get off a cure quite easily. Secondly, most enemies aren't relentless with their attacks, leaving you with brief windows to comb through the menu if necessary, though you'll likely need to stay mobile to avoid any surprise attacks. It's a unique system, which is implemented with consideration for how and when the player will interact with it. It doesn't take long to get acclimated. Generally speaking, KH's combat ebbs and flows between aggressive, defensive, and evasive. Each enemy's movement and skill set lead to a need to adopt different tactics to deal with them. The game even encourages a slightly more reserved or mixed playstyle through the tech point system, bonus experience points rewarded for optimal play, such as parrying, guarding, or deflecting certain enemy attacks, such as a large body's charge or a fat bandit's fireballs, or using magic that a particular enemy is weak to, like casting Blizzard on a red nocturne. One of the more slept-on aspects of the character building in KH is the Keyblade itself, or rather the various different keychains you can acquire. Each one has its own strength modifier, reach, critical hit rate and efficacy, and some even affect the potency of magic, which in this game is tied to your total MP. The more MP you have, the stronger your magic is. I'd imagine most players are keen to just throw on the keychain with the highest strength stat and be done with it, but the game is structured in a way that encourages experimenting with different permutations for different situations. My favorite example of this is probably Atlantica, where Sora, Donald, and Goofy are transformed into aquatic forms to fit in with the locals. As a result, most of your combat abilities aren't usable here, and because of the fully three-dimensional movement controls, it can be awkward to move around and fight in this world, especially with the agile Heartless skulking around every corner, but in the lead-up to coming here, the game drops several hints that maybe you should try considering a build focused more on spellcasting than melee. Your 
Fire and Blizzard spells were recently upgraded at the end of Agrabah. You can learn the Stop spell at the end of Monstro, who swallows your ship mid-flight when moving on from Agrabah. And because Stop was the last basic spell to learn, Merlin will now give Sora the Spellbinder keychain, which isn't physically strong but boosts his max MP by two points, which in turn boosts his magic power. Don't misunderstand me, Atlantica is probably my least favorite world in the game because of how awkward it feels, but pivoting to focus on magic like the game subtly suggests makes it much more bearable. Not every player will have the same experience, however, as the abilities Sora learns while leveling up are determined by the weapon chosen at the start of the tutorial section, the Dive to the Heart. Stats will largely be the same with a few things shuffled around, and while Sora will learn all of the same abilities no matter which one you choose, the levels when they're learned changes significantly. For example, Sora will learn Guard at level 9 if you choose the Shield, level 24 with the Rod, and level 36 with the Sword. In exchange, the Sword will see him learning abilities that affect his combos early, be it extending them, changing his finisher, or swinging in a wider arc, resulting in a slightly more aggressive playstyle. The tutorial also sports a brief series of questions assessing the player's personality to determine the rate of experience growth. Depending on how they answer, the party can either have a steady experience curve all the way to level 100, accelerated growth up to level 50 and slower gains between 51 and 100, or slow growth up to 50 and a lower curve up to the cap. I also admire how each of these outcomes is tied to a specific time of day for the player's metaphorical journey to begin. It's easy to get the one you want by selecting specific answers. All the top answers for fast initial growth, middle ones for a steady curve, and the bottom ones for a slow start. But it's one of several small but consequential choices for the player to make that helps define Kingdom Hearts as an RPG. Abilities are another role-playing element here, mostly taking their cues from Final Fantasy IX, though unlike that game where you learn abilities from your equipment, here you learn abilities as you level up or reach certain milestones. You have a pool of ability points or AP that you use to activate new skills and passive buffs. It isn't permanent though, so you can experiment with different abilities as you like. There are also shared abilities, which enhance movement by allowing you to swim faster, jump higher, and even glide through the air without costing AP. AP increases occasionally on level up, but can also be boosted by certain accessories, the best of which are achieved through item synthesis. Like in FF9, synthesis isn't terribly complex here, though it is a bit more streamlined thanks to the lack of a fee, weapons not being used as materials, and the vast majority of materials dropping from enemies. You can create helpful items like elixirs and stat boosters, powerful accessories as previously mentioned, and, after creating everything the Moogles have listed, the Ultima weapon. The best Keyblade in the game by a long shot. It has the highest strength modifier, a long reach, and boosts MP by two points. Points. Obviously, its name is a reference to the recurring weapon in the Final Fantasy series, but its design is distinct from those of its namesake. Rather than a cool-colored ethereal blade, this Ultima weapon is an evolution of the Dream Sword from the Dive to the Heart, with gold livery, teeth resembling the crown on Sora's necklace, and a heart charm for its keychain. It's a subtle visual bookend showing how Sora's grown over the course of the story. The Dream Shield and Rod can be obtained for Donald and Goofy too, though they're not their best weapons. Those would be Save the King and Queen respectively, which also reference a recurring weapon from the Final Fantasy series. The surprisingly robust character building and customization applies to Donald, Goofy, and the various guest party members as much as it does Sora. While the guest cast already know every ability available to them from the off, they don't have enough AP to use them all. While you could expend valuable AP ups to remedy this, the fact that they're locked to a specific world makes this kind of wasteful. So instead, you have to make careful choices about what it is you want them to do and what role you want them to fill. Are they going to be offensive or pure? Purely support. This also extends to every ally's general behavior, how often they use special attacks or items. I basically just set everyone to use regular attacks frequently, special attacks and magic occasionally, and advanced and defensive magic, as well as items, only in emergencies. This is how you're able to get your allies to really work for you. That, and using the triangle button to get them to focus on the enemy you're locked onto, or group up with you when you don't have a lock. 
Between being selective with their abilities and how you adjust their AI, you can turn Sora, Donald, and Goofy into a well-oiled machine. With the settings I used, Donald was always quick to heal, and while Goofy does have his own special techniques that cost MP, his conservative use of them meant that he tended to have one or two points in reserve to replenish Sora or Donald's MP by three when they run low. Combined with MP Rage, which restores MP when they take damage, and MP Haste, which increases MP restoration, and these two unlikely allies of yours become consistently strong and dependable. I also find Goofy's ability to restore Sora and Donald's MP to be a fun reflection of how he's the mediator of the group. But Goofy isn't the only member of the trio who gets special abilities which cost MP. Throughout the game, Sora will learn a handful of limit breaks, though they're not referred to as such here. Ars Arcanum, Ragnarok, Strike Raid, and Sonic Blade are all able to be learned, with their activation being based on proximity to your target. There's also Trinity Limit, which is acquired after beating the Hades Cup in the late game, which requires at least 3 MP and spends everything the trio has to deal massive damage to every enemy. It's basically a screen nuke, and while I like how it embodies the camaraderie and friendship that they've forged and its MP cost reflects their motto of all for one and one for all, that cost, as well as needing 5 AP to equip it, makes me really hesitant to use it because of how it can leave you completely vulnerable if it doesn't take out everything, or if there's another wave of Heartless right after. It works great thematically, and it's visually splendid, but it's not something I use often. Trinity limit aside, all of Sora's limit breaks require additional inputs, which are pretty time-sensitive. Press the button too early, and you accidentally cancel the attack prematurely. The effectiveness of the limit breaks varies significantly, though my personal favorites are the lower-cost ones, Strike Raid and Sonic Blade. The latter does okay damage, but zips you around quickly, making it harder for enemies to hit you. The former may be completely stationary, but not only does it deal a fair amount of damage to late-game enemies from afar, but it also makes Sora completely invincible while using it, which makes it especially desirable to give the player a bit of a reprieve or protection against stronger attacks. These two attacks also help address what I feel is the biggest weakness of the combat, Sora's limited range. Sure, you can use magic to hit distant enemies, but that effectiveness varies. Fire has the greatest distance, but that distance is finite, and it has a wide arc when tracking. Gravity does damage relative to the target's current HP, just like in Final Fantasy. Thunder and Blizzard can hit out-of-reach groups of enemies in different ways, but Blizzard has a short range and very few enemies are particularly weak to either of them. Nine times out of ten, melee is the most effective way to deal with enemies, and Sora can only close small gaps without spending MP on Sonic Blade or Strike Raid. Combined with the camera, this can lead to some frustration when it looks like you're about to hit an enemy, but your swing falls short. The camera's positioning and control are the biggest hindrance of Kingdom Hearts' gameplay. Most of the time, it's situated pretty close to Sora, which leads to a somewhat narrow view, though thankfully this issue tends to be eased whenever you lock onto an enemy, as now the camera will focus on them as you continue to freely move Sora. The control and the camera's tendency to get caught behind walls and objects are the real detractors here. The latter is self-explanatory, as it can obscure your view at the most inopportune moments, though it may surprise some of you to hear me say that the former isn't a total miss, but rather a double-edged sword. On the one hand, yes, the camera only being able to be rotated with L2 and R2 when it exists in a 3D space is borderline antithetical to its function in that space. However, this decision begins to make a certain sense when you realize that the right analog stick can be used to navigate the command menu instead of the directional buttons. In fact, it's more ergonomic to do it this way, as using the D-pad while trying to move around results in an uncomfortable claw grip, even if for just a few seconds. But just because it makes sense doesn't mean it's a good compromise, at least in my opinion, especially when one considers the overall level design. Super Mario 64 was the impetus for what would eventually become Kingdom Hearts, and this is best reflected in the design and construction of the game's worlds. Not only is there a fair amount of vertical platforming, but a strong sense of exploration and discovery that permeates throughout the entire experience, both mechanically and thematically. Every time I play this game, I learn something new. How a seemingly innocuous environmental interaction will yield some small reward, that there's a chest tucked away somewhere I would never have thought to look, or how some cutscenes change depending on the order you hit certain story beats. The world map even feeds into this, as new, unvisited worlds are represented by a question mark. You have to go there yourself to learn what it is. 
Exploration is further encouraged thanks to Trinities, little colored marks scattered throughout each world that Sora, Donald, and Goofy can interact with to unlock special goodies. At first, you can only activate the blue ones while finding them in the various other colors as you progress, which entice you to come back later once you've unlocked the ability to use that trinity. The shared abilities I mentioned earlier, specifically Glide and High Jump, also encourage going back to explore these nooks and crannies you can't quite reach on your first trip. The Trinities are only one of a small handful of things to keep an eye out for. There are also the 99 Dalmatian puppies, which were scattered when Pongo and Perdido lost their world to the Heartless. Amusingly, Squall seems personally invested in seeing the puppies returned as he asks Sora to find them in a minor but easily missable dialogue before leaving Traverse Town for the first time. The Dalmatians show their gratitude to Sora when certain thresholds are reached, mostly parts for the gummy ship, but most significantly the final upgrade for the very helpful and defensive wind magic, and one of the other major collectibles, a torn page. On the second visit to Traverse Town, Sid asks Sora to deliver a book to Merlin, having restored it as best he could, but there are still some pages missing. This book turns out to contain a world of its own, the Hundred Acre Wood from Winnie the Pooh, though without those last few pages you can't see the world through to completion. There are five of them in total, and they can all be found by the end of the second act, but unlike the other worlds, there are no Heartless here. It's a mini-game world, with several rewards, large and small, that can be found while exploring and acquired after each page's minigame is completed, ranging from synthesis items to Stopra and the Summon Stone for Bambi. He's the one summon I forgot to use in my main playthrough for this video, but to be honest, I don't find most of the summons to be terribly useful to begin with aside from Tinkerbell, who periodically heals small amounts of HP and fully restores you then leaves if you would be defeated. And maybe Mushu, because he can absolutely melt enemies. But there's still one last pillar to Kingdom Hearts as a game the gummy ship, which is how you travel to different worlds. It's not terribly sophisticated, nor very exciting. You are able to customize and build your own ships using the pieces you collect from destroyed ships and find here and there while exploring, and while it's not at all necessary to do so, I find it to be the most fun aspect of this part of the game. You can build hulking behemoths with massive engines and tons of cannons and lasers decked out with overshields and a speed booster, or sleek agile fighters to make these sections go by as quick as possible. But after the second visit to Traverse Town, you'll only be playing these sections on your first trip to a new world. Otherwise, you'll just be using the warp drive to skip the gummy routes because there's really not much on offer here. It definitely gets better once you start making your own ships, but it's a mild improvement. Gummy ship aside, Kingdom Hearts' gameplay is surprisingly fun and robust with plenty of options for players to toy around with, while still keeping things pretty simple overall. Of course, there are some blemishes, namely the camera and Sora's melee range, but I feel that while there's certainly issues, especially the camera, they aren't enough to drag the whole experience down all the time. But that simplicity can also breed a certain level of complacency, just mashing attack over and over because, while maybe not always optimal, it still works, at least on normal difficulty. On Expert Mode, however, which was added to international versions of the game, enemies deal significantly more damage, and as a result, you have to take positioning and preparedness more into account. It is legitimately challenging, but it also lowers the requirements to unlock a special secret ending, though we'll discuss that another time. The international versions didn't stop there with the challenge, though, as they also included three new optional secret bosses that weren't in the original Japanese release, in addition to the Phantom. Each of them tests your skills and familiarity with the game's mechanics in ways that a typical playthrough wouldn't, and are incredibly tense. The Phantom tests resource management, as you need to cast Stop on the Clock Tower to prevent it from removing your party members from the battle before doing the same to you, but you also need to cast the right spell on the Phantom's orb to deal damage to it, with the monster resetting its pattern every fourth hit, leading to a protracted fight where you have to manage your MP and MP restoration items in order to succeed. Kurt Zisa, named for the winner of a contest to get their name in the game, moves fast and hits hard with a single weak point, but it also has phases where it casts silence on the whole party and forces you to use melee attacks, and raises a shield around itself which can only be destroyed with magic attacks. This tests adaptability and mobility. 
The Ice Titan, who is fought in the gold match at the Colosseum, is probably the most underwhelming secret boss, as it basically just requires you to deflect its icicles back at it to get it to bend the knee so you can smack it in the face. You do have to stay on the move to avoid its area of effect attack and the ice balls it drops on you, and you can't use arrow to boost your defense as it'll make its projectiles larger and unable to be deflected, but it's generally a pretty simple fight. But the Platinum match is easily the toughest challenge in the whole game, testing your resource management, mobility, reaction time, the whole nine yards. And what better way to push players to their limits than by bringing in the most iconic villain in Square's catalog. Complete with a new design incorporating his one-winged angel motif, and accompanied by a cut-down rearrangement of his seminal final boss theme, Sephiroth wordlessly commands an intimidating presence even to those unfamiliar with Final Fantasy VII. His swift strikes and devastating techniques keep you on your toes the whole time, and offer the highest level of challenge in Kingdom Hearts. Even on normal difficulty, he'll give you plenty of trouble. Of course, all of these secret bosses are only able to be fought towards the end of the game, but I find this only enhances that feeling of discovery, and this thankfully extends to the multitude of Disney worlds the player will visit over the course of their adventure. Let me preface this section by saying that I wasn't much of a Disney kid. I had seen and enjoyed some things produced by the Walt Disney Company, of course, and had even been to Disney World a few times before picking up Kingdom Hearts. But broadly speaking, I was pretty unfamiliar with most of what was on display in this game when I first played it all those years ago. I was aware of them, of course, but of the nine Disney properties that have their own world in this game, I had only seen three of them. Since then, I've seen a bit more of what got their own world in this game, and I honestly believe that the development team did a great job at translating these movies into the game, though not without certain creative liberties and compromises. The character designs have made the transition to 3D surprisingly well, even if the animation isn't quite as fluid as the original works. The Disney animators that checked the team's work had a bit of trouble accepting that the shift to 3D had necessitated changes to the character's movements, no matter how faithful the team wanted to be to the originals. There are even some more cartoony moments sprinkled through the game, reminiscent of what one may see in an old Disney short, like Donald being flattened by a door or comedy smash cuts. They're executed pretty well and do a fair job of adding some levity to a game which can, at times, get just a bit dark. Each world is not only recognizable as based on a particular work, but has its own identity in terms of aesthetics and gameplay. Deep Jungle is very vertical, with areas stacked on top of each other from the camp and thicket all the way up to the treehouse. Depending on where you jump down from the ladder, you'll end up in different parts of the world. Agrabah is defined by its navigation puzzles, with different paths in the city being blocked off during the story, requiring you to pay attention to your surroundings to find new ways to get around. And the Cave of Wonders is structured somewhat similarly, requiring you to break a pillar in the lower chambers to access the deepest cavern. Atlantica is designed around full three-dimensional movements, though like I said earlier, it can be awkward to control. Originally, about 30 worlds had been considered for the game, knowing that the number would have to be cut down to make the project more manageable. Disney Castle was one such world, which, based on promotional footage and its presence on the map screen, was likely cut late in development. Others include worlds based on Atlantis, the Lost Empire, which according to Nomura didn't fit very well or connect with other worlds, and Toy Story, which had concept art for its planetoid in a design document. I love Toy Story and lament its exclusion, but overall I do find the selection of worlds we ultimately did get to be pretty solid. 
There are a couple of oddities here and there, though, such as how empty the worlds can feel since the list of characters is mostly stripped down to the bare necessities. But the most peculiar worlds are Wonderland, Monstro, and Neverland. The latter doesn't even feature Neverland itself, just Captain Hook's ship and Big Ben. This decision was made because, according to an interview with the map and design team for the Kingdom Hearts Ultimania, the game already had an urban world in Traverse Town and an island-themed world in the Destiny Islands, so visiting Neverland or London may have felt a bit redundant. I can understand the reasoning, and I don't think London needed to have been considered. Big Ben's inclusion is more than enough considering how iconic it is to the original film, but calling the world Neverland when you never even go there, even when the plot of the world doesn't really necessitate it, is just a bit perplexing. Wonderland, meanwhile, is really creative with its structure. There are very few spaces, but you navigate them in multiple ways, with the bizarre room being the fulcrum. You pop out of various nooks and crannies on the walls and ceiling to find more and more odd and looping paths through the world. It's very much in keeping with the topsy-turvy illogical logic of Wonderland. The strangeness in its adaptation, however, comes from the boxy design of each area. Like, literally, they're all enclosed like boxes, with physical ceilings that meet the physical walls of the room. I've heard a few theories floating around for why this is, such as Wonderland itself being a product of Alice's dreams like in the movie and Lewis Carroll's original book, each room being inside the walls of the Bizarre Room, and trying to make the world aesthetically resemble a dark ride from one of the Disney parks, but I'm not too sure about any of these. The best explanation I can come up with is that it's Wonderland and doesn't have to make sense, which ironically would probably make the most sense. Go figure. Monstro is an odd case, as while he is effectively a world based on Pinocchio, the aesthetic and concept had to be created from scratch. Originally, he was going to be a boss for the gummy ship part of the game, but the team couldn't get it working, and so they decided to turn Monstro into a sort of mini-world. You travel through his body, divided into six chambers, all of which look the same aside from layout. It can be confusing to navigate here, but if you just enter the passageways that glow green, you'll be fine. You can skip this world if you want, like I did on my first playthrough, but you miss out on some development for Riku if you do. You can come back and do it much, much later, but but events will play out a little differently. Not so much that the course of the narrative will change, but enough that the story being told here feels a lot limper. Broadly speaking, it's impressive how carefully considered some of the plots in the Disney worlds tie back into the overall story. Not necessarily because there are always major plot developments, but there tends to be some interesting meditations on the nature of darkness and hearts which act as foreshadowing, or information about the villain's plans. There are still some significant story beats spread throughout them though, such as Alice and Jasmine's kidnappings, with the latter of the two being perpetrated by Riku. In fact, Neverland is here almost exclusively to move the overarching story forward, with Sora finally finding a comatose Kairi before Riku whisks her away again, and Captain Hook revealing that Maleficent's base of operations is the decaying ruins of the castle Hollow Bastion. They're all mostly self-contained stories, but they're less vestigial limbs and more building blocks, parts of a greater whole. Most of the original English voice actors reprised their roles, including Catherine Beaumont as Alice and Wendy Darling, 50 years after playing them in their respective films. Also of note are James Woods as Hades, Pat Carroll as Ursula, Jodie Benson as Ariel, and Robbie Benson as The Beast, the latter of whom is most let down by the stiff facial animation which plagues most of the characters. Unlike the principal cast and select Disney characters, who also have a detailed face model used for specific scenes, most characters only have a flat face texture with a basic mouth flapping animation. Characters look like lifeless dolls when these faces are used, and it's down to the voice actors to make up for it as a result. The Disney cast thankfully are able to overcome this, at least for the most part. Brian Blessed, who plays Clayton the Hunter, sits in a strange in-between space for me in this regard. He's not phoning it in, but he's definitely much more reserved than he usually is. He never goes full ham like you'd expect, but he does tiptoe towards that threshold once or twice, so it's a bit disappointing. The voice cast for the non-Disney characters is a bit of a mixed bag. Nomura wanted Haley Joel Osment as Sora's English voice before casting had even started for the Japanese version. Despite his young age, Osment was an accomplished actor who had been nominated for an Academy Award for his performance in M. Night Shyamalan's The Sixth Sense. And just before recording for Sora, he had starred in AI, directed by Steven Spielberg but conceived by the late Stanley Kubrick. The challenge for Osment wasn't the character, the material, or any expectations that may have been set upon him, but his own voice. 
His voice had begun to change while recording Kingdom Hearts, presenting him with the challenge of maintaining Sora's youthful tone and energy while trying to sound consistent. For the most part, he manages to succeed, though there are definitely times where you can clearly tell he's going through puberty. You're stupid! For what it's worth, I don't mind the occasional cracks in his voice. Sora isn't much older than Osment was at the time, and it's not as though they're frequent enough to be distracting. He turns in a fair performance, but really shines during the game's emotional highlights. Sora's design, while still recognizable as the work of Tetsuya Nomura, is rounded out a bit to fit in with the general Disney aesthetic. And similarly, Donald and Goofy, who originally wore their regular clothing, got some new duds from Nomura as well at Disney's request. He made a conscious effort not to stray too far from Donald and Goofy's iconic designs, retaining the general composition of their outfits and their associated colors, but adding extra details, notably zippers, to bring them a bit more in line with Sora's outfit. It's an aesthetic motif that Nomura likes, one which has seen its fair share of derision, but regardless of whether you love it or hate it, you can still tell that it's his work at a glance. And I think that's worth at least a modicum of respect. One major aspect of Sora's outfits that I feel often goes unnoticed is its loose resemblance to Mickey Mouse. The red shorts, white gloves, and yellow shoes make up the classic outfit of Disney's mascot, and Sora's predominantly black jacket stands in for the black fur of the mouse's uncovered torso. Mickey, Donald, and Goofy starred in a plethora of shorts dating all the way back to the 1930s, so I imagine that giving Sora this color palette to suddenly evoke Mickey was deliberate. It's also probably why his shoes, often mocked for their comical size, are so large. Another possibility for these similarities, though not a mutually exclusive one, could stem from the heavily restricted manner in which they could actually use Mickey Mouse in the game. Originally, the mouse was completely off-limits, as another company had the rights to the character for their own game. But with enough persistence, Square were eventually granted permission to use him in a single scene under certain conditions. This was almost certainly to prevent market confusion regarding what could be described as the new Mickey Mouse game, and thus allow Disney to maintain an amicable relationship with the company which did have the video game rights to their mascot at that time. This was most likely Capcom, as they were developing Disney's Magical Mirror starring Mickey Mouse for the Nintendo GameCube, which would be released a month prior to Kingdom Hearts in North America. You can decry this as Disney overcomplicating such a seemingly small matter, and I could break down some of the corporate minutia that would lead to a decision like that, but I think it'd be much easier to summarize it as Disney gonna Disney. But there is one aspect of Kingdom Hearts that Disney doesn't own and thus had little control over, possibly the only reason why some Square fans even bought the game in the first place. The Final Fantasy characters. In the lead-up to its release, it wasn't terribly uncommon to hear people refer to Kingdom Hearts as a crossover between Disney and Final Fantasy. And given that it is Square we're talking about, it wouldn't be too far off the mark to say so. But as far as I can tell, based on my research, nobody at either company had ever directly referred to it in such a way. Moreover, while the Disney elements are very much in the spotlight for about 80% of the game or so, with several characters becoming guest party members in their respective worlds, the Final Fantasy characters instead mostly just hang back and act as supporting characters. Just as well, unlike the Disney characters, who are meant to be the same iterations from their original works, the FF cast are, in Nomura's words, more like parallel universe versions. The decision to include characters like Squall, Sid, and Yuffie was one made for the sake of brevity. Over the course of the story, there would be numerous small roles that would need to be filled, and while the original goal seemed to be to place Disney characters in those roles, such as the nephews running the item shop in Traverse Town or the fairy godmother awakening summon gems, there were too many roles which Nomura felt would be unbecoming of them. While he and the team could have created new original characters for this purpose, he felt that such characters wouldn't be as appealing as the Disney characters that they'd be standing beside. So instead, he resolved to insert already existing Square characters into these spots. It sounds like a strange compromise, but between Disney's strict mandate regarding their characters crossing over with each other, and some of the roles the FF cast ended up filling, I can see the logic. 
Merlin from The Sword in the Stone acts as one of a handful of key mentor figures for Sora, offering him a place to practice magic and rewarding him with a new keychain after he's reached a certain level of proficiency. The Fairy Godmother from Cinderella is another one, as I just noted. Both are reasonable choices. But how many Disney characters are a swordsman, an authority figure, and an actual character? Squall Leonhardt from Final Fantasy VIII ultimately takes up this mantle in the story and acts as Sora's most consistent mentor figure. Having now actually played FF8 since playing Kingdom Hearts, I can understand why Squall was put in this position. Squall's arc in Final Fantasy VIII dealt with, among other things, accepting the responsibilities bestowed upon him and learning to become a leader. In Kingdom Hearts, that's exactly what he is. He's the leader of the Final Fantasy characters whose world fell to darkness years ago and forced them to flee to Traverse Town. He's a bit older, takes charge when the situation gets dicey, and advises Sora on what he should be doing. I also just thought of this while recording, but the lucky charm that he gives to Sora that ends up being the summon gem for Simba, that's a nice cheeky griever reference. This Squall has gone through his character arc and become an actual leader, just like his original incarnation. Though just like the original, he also tends to get quiet when he's stumped on something he doesn't have the solution to. Of course, I'm kind of burying the lead a bit here. As anyone who's played Kingdom Hearts can tell you, Squall goes by the name Leon in this game. Not because his name is actually changed, as Yuffie does call him Squall once or twice early on, but because Jun Akiyama felt that King Mickey's letter telling Donald and Goofy to find Squall would weaken the moment when the player actually meets him, as they would already have an idea of what to expect. Akiyama suggested changing his name so that players would be surprised to see him, and so they just used that part of his name. It's a cheap trick, but they do incorporate this name change into the character's background in a way that gives it a bit more weight. Squall changed his name after failing to prevent his world from falling to darkness. He wanted to escape that shame and the person he was back then, someone who wasn't strong enough to make a difference. Compounding this are the angel wings on the back of his jacket, a visual nod to Renoa Hartley, Squall's love interest in Final Fantasy VIII, implying that she may have once been a character in the Kingdom Hearts universe who Squall couldn't save and has been bearing that guilt ever since. Perhaps his investment in seeing the Dalmatian puppies saved is an extension of this, as Renoa did have a dog, Angelo, who was a very good girl, provided she existed in this universe. It's subtle and would certainly pass by anyone who hadn't played FF8, but it's also a detail which doesn't impede one's understanding of the character in this context. In my opinion, Squall, who for the sake of consistency with the material being discussed I'll refer to as Leon from here on out, is the Final Fantasy character who is portrayed most faithfully to their original incarnation. At least in terms of characterization, because design-wise, while far from unrecognizable, he is definitely a bit removed from the original. I don't mind the short sleeves, as they can be seen as an outward expression of his willingness to be more open with others, but the longer hair, which is possibly a nod to an early piece of concept art of him for FF8, really doesn't work for me. The runner-up to this would be Cloud from Final Fantasy VII, who appears as a combatant at the Olympus Coliseum. He's searching for someone, briefly allies himself with Hades, and uses dark powers to try and find them, but the Lord of the Dead betrays him. It's not clear who he's searching for, but I'd imagine a fair number of those who played Final Fantasy VII weren't as concerned with that as they were with his appearance. It's still obviously Cloud, but now with cloth bandages wrapped around his buster sword, a tattered red cape, a gold claw on his left hand, and, as seen during rematches with him in later cups, a single demonic wing protruding from the left side of his back whenever he uses dark powers. While the wing is obviously an homage to Sephiroth, who in this game has an angelic black wing protruding from the opposite side to reflect clouds, the cape and claw are reminiscent of another FF7 party member, Vincent Valentine, who Nomura also wanted to appear somewhere in the game, but unfortunately wasn't able to make it happen. However, this proved to be something of a blessing in disguise for him, as aspects of Vincent's design resonated with what he wanted to do with Cloud here. Quote, Yes, his left arm is based off of Vincent. Cloud was a character that is leaning towards the darkness, so I wanted to make him demon-like. Vincent was created to be that way, so I thought of adding that on." End quote. 
As far as his personality goes, Cloud is a bit of a mishmash of who he was at the very beginning of Final Fantasy VII, moody and aloof, but also laser-focused on finding someone like he was up through the early parts of Disc 2. Not a bad guy by any means, but definitely his own worst enemy. His depiction here is technically accurate in that he did have these traits in his original game, just not all at once. He's sort of a composite version of himself. Unfortunately, there isn't really much else to say about his Kingdom Hearts incarnation, and there's even less to say about the rest of the FF characters as you go down the list. Sid is the last one that I can say makes sense in the role he plays. He's a gummy ship engineer, installing new navigation pieces as the plot demands and selling you ship parts. In fact, he was the one who got Leon, Yuffie, Aerith, and very possibly Cloud away from their homeworld when the Heartless began to overrun it. The reason Sid works here is because he was an airship engineer with aspirations of going to space in Final Fantasy VII, but personality-wise, while he's still a bit of a grump, he's been toned way down from his original version for obvious reasons. Can't have him biting on a cigarette and swearing like a sailor in a kid's game. After that, most of them feel like they're here to fill space. Alongside Sora, Riku, and Kairi, the Destiny Islands are also inhabited by aged-down versions of Tidus and Waka from Final Fantasy X, and Selfie from Final Fantasy VIII. The former two I understand to an extent because of Tidus being a star Blitzball player, and Waka actually being an Islander. Though originally, Irvine from FF8 was meant to be in Waka's place, but Nomura just couldn't figure out how to make him fit the island theme, and threw in Waka at the last minute. Selfie I can only understand from a personality perspective. She already acted like a child in Final Fantasy VIII, so I guess all she needed was to be aged down, and that's it. Aerith and Yuffie, like Waka, were originally supposed to have their roles filled by other characters. While Yuffie was slated to appear elsewhere, her position beside Leon early on was meant to be filled by Riku from Final Fantasy X. However, circumstances led to Yuffie being swapped into Riku's place and Yuffie's original place in the story was excised. It's been theorized that this change was due to the Kingdom Hearts original character Riku having a name which, while spelled slightly differently, is pronounced exactly the same as FF10 Riku in the English version. However, their Japanese names, Riku and Ryuku, are much more distinct, which calls this theory into question. Considering that localization for Kingdom Hearts was taken into account relatively early on, though, it's not implausible. Like her original FF7 incarnation, Yuffie is a bit of a smart aleck here, but she's nowhere near as energetic or mischievous as she was before. The latter is understandable to a degree, as the circumstances of her being here, while similar to a certain degree, probably wouldn't lead to her scheming to betray the heroes like in FF7. There, Yuffie is the daughter of Goto Kisaragi, the leader of the Wutai Nation, which had been at war with the Shinra Electric Power Company for most of her childhood. They would ultimately be defeated, and their proud and mystical warrior culture would begin to be stamped out as their capital was converted into a tourist attraction at Godo's suggestion. Yuffie, who is 16 years old in FF7, goes off to try and find, or more accurately, steal, as much materia as she can to try and give her people the power to fight off Shinra and regain their independence. But whereas in FF7 her home still exists and she feels that her father, their leader, gave up and betrayed their culture, in Kingdom Hearts she seems to have no home to go back to, and the leaders that she trusts, Leon and Sid, haven't done anything that she would see as a betrayal. Given that context, dialing back Yuffie's roguish behavior makes sense. Unfortunately, it also robs her of her most unique character trait, at least in my opinion. Aerith, meanwhile, fills a role that wasn't going to be for a Final Fantasy character at all, but rather Aya Brea from Parasite Eve. This was changed when the staff who had also worked on Final Fantasy VII requested that Aerith be used instead about halfway through development. Having now actually played Final Fantasy VII, I feel that Yuffie and Aerith specifically didn't need to be here in Traverse Town with Leon. It's not that they can't be here or that what they do is necessarily out of character, though in Aerith's case it vaguely follows a larger pattern in her post-FF7 depictions that I won't get into here, but it feels like what they do could have been done by almost any random FF character. Given that the most they do is help with exposition early on, I can absolutely understand why Riku and Aya were supposed to be here. The former did a bit of that early in Final Fantasy X, and while I haven't played Parasite Eve, after a cursory search on the character, I can imagine that someone like Aya would be well suited to laying out the particulars of a situation like this. 
Afterward, they just kind of hang around, with Aerith finding a big chunk of Ansem's notes and teaching Sora Kiraga at Hollow Bastion towards the end of the game. The latter is a nice touch, since she was basically the White Mage of FF7, but it's literally the only thing I feel is really in keeping with the general idea of the character. There's not much to say about Sephiroth. He's a secret boss that exists outside the confines of the actual narrative. He's fine. Well, except his voice. In fact, most of the voice cast for the Final Fantasy characters isn't all that good. Christy Carlson Romano is fine as Yuffie, and Mandy Moore is clearly trying as Aerith, but neither have that much to work with in terms of substance or material. Steve Burton is leaning into Cloud's moody aloofness, but he just sounds bored. And David Boreanaz, famous for playing Angel in the Buffyverse, sounds really bored as Leon. I could understand if this was intentional, trying to capture the stoicism of the character in Final Fantasy VIII, but even if that were the case, it really doesn't come across. And then there's Lance Bass from NSYNC as Sephiroth, which is… certainly a choice. Not a good choice in my opinion, but definitely a choice. As for the kids on the island, considering that they've been aged down here, I think they're fine. Just fine. Except D. Bradley Baker's stumble on his very first line. Hey, what's happening, man? Thankfully, these characters and the command menu weren't the only things that Kingdom Hearts inherited from Final Fantasy, because while Nobuo Uematsu may not have been involved in the game, Yoko Shimomura is no slouch. If there's one thing that Disney is known for, it's musicals. Most of their animated feature film catalog is made up of them, and countless tracks from them have permeated popular culture for decades. Among the millions of people who would fall in love with Disney in their youth was Yoko Shimomura, who would be tasked with not just composing music that could fit alongside the works of Alan Menken, Danny Elfman, and the Sherman Brothers, among others, but tracks which would imbue Kingdom Hearts with its own bespoke identity. All this while heavily pregnant, and then raising a newborn. It was a monumental task, one which she was initially reluctant to undertake. Despite her love of Disney, she couldn't wrap her head around what sort of music would suit whatever Kingdom Hearts was supposed to be, and this hesitation would be combined with having to work within the limitations of the PS2 sound hardware, leaving her unable to properly reproduce all of the Disney tracks she had envisioned. This would lead her to engage in a process of trial and error in order to get as close to what she wanted as possible in certain cases, while striving to complement and maintain the original tone of those seminal works. It's stunning just how quickly Shimomura's score establishes that musical identity with a single track. I had mentioned Dearly Beloved earlier, and how its serenity complements the simplicity of the main menu, but it also imbues senses of melancholy and mysticism in equal measure, that there will be sadness and loss, but also a twinkling of hope that it won't all be doom and gloom. As the crashing waves in the menu's soundscape would imply, Dearly Beloved was inspired by the ocean surrounding the Destiny Islands. As Shimamura would recall in a 2020 interview promoting a later title, quote, I was playing the beginning of the game, set in the Destiny Islands, and I was struck by a lot of imagery about the sea. Dearly Beloved just came to my mind one day while I was thinking about that, picturing the sea and the waves. End quote. Surprisingly, this wasn't conceived as a menu track. She had thought of it being fitting for a cutscene somewhere, but she would accept and ultimately embrace its placement as the track that would greet new players at the start of their journey, citing it as her favorite track in the game. I have to commend Shimamura for being able to juggle such a wide range of tones across over 70 tracks while also producing new instrumental arrangements of classic Disney tunes. A handful of these tracks, most notably Under the Sea, can get a bit grating, but this is thankfully offset by the original battle tracks composed to accompany them. They aren't simply up-tempo or more complex versions of Disney music, but original, complementary pieces. None of them feel out of step with the music which is played outside of battle, which I feel is a notable achievement. But I want to focus specifically on the tracks which were not made in service to the Disney worlds, which while not quite as varied, are definitely striking. Distati, which plays during the Dive to the Heart, is one such notable example, driven initially by an ominous choir, with a droning piano acting as a metronome. 
It's initially a simple yet haunting piece, signaling the grandiose nature of the story that is yet to unfold. But it continues to build as you dive deeper, until the full orchestra begins to hand off with the choir. The tension rises until you finally come face to face with a monstrous distortion of your own shadow, a representation of the coming evil that you are fated to stop. But it's okay, because no matter what happens, you are the one who will open the door. Amusingly, the sound team would consider this track to be cursed, as whenever they would try and add the choral section to the soundtrack, something would inevitably go wrong, with the worst example being when the entire building's power cut out. The original battle tracks are all solid affair, with a strong focus on melody, as one would expect from someone who had been composing game music since the Famicom era. But if I had to pick just one to listen to, it would have to be Hand in Hand, the standard battle theme used in Traverse Town on return visits. It isn't heart-pounding like Destati, Destiny's Force, or the oft-used Shrouding Dark Cloud, but it does embody that ever-present spirit of adventure that I love so much about this game. It's more than just a battle theme, it's evocative of the call to journey forth and discover all that there is to see. This is embodied further with the Gummy Ship theme, which evolves from a fairly light tune into something much more foreboding as you trek closer and closer towards the heart of darkness. On the flip side, the theme for Traverse Town is a calming piece which encapsulates the town's purpose very well. It's a sanctuary for those who have lost their homes to the Heartless, and while it may be cast in eternal night, the lights are always on, and the doors are always open, for any refugees or weary travelers who stop by. In a similar vein is the game's sole character theme. It's not for Sora or Riku, though one could argue that they could be represented by Hand in Hand and Villains of a Sort respectively. No, instead, the one character who gets a recurring leitmotif is Kairi, who has the least amount of presence of the island trio. It's a tranquil piece in all three iterations, but probably my favorite of them is the music box-like rendition which plays when Sora witnesses a memory of Kairi and her grandmother before heading to Hollow Bastion. Maybe that's a bit of a cop-out since the first two versions don't sound all that different from each other, but I can be a bit of a sucker for this kind of sound. Kairi's design also carries a subtle nod to the game's soundtrack. Her hairstyle is based on that of Japanese-American pop artist and songwriter Utada Hikaru, who wrote and performed the game's theme song in both languages, Hikari in Japanese and Simple and Clean in English. This decision came from Nomura despite protests from the rest of the development staff, who felt that the superstar would never go for it. But to everyone's surprise, their representatives agreed to an initial meeting because Utada liked video games, and when Nomura sent the singer a presentation of what the game was, they got back to him within a couple of days enthusiastically agreeing to take part. This was an exceptional coup, as Utada's popularity in Japan was comparable to that of Britney Spears in the United States, and what they turned in is easily the most memorable song from the game. Yoko Shimamura even recorded a wonderful orchestral arrangement of it for the video that plays if you linger on the title screen for too long. Unfortunately, due to how stringent YouTube's content ID system is with Utada's music, I can't share a sample of the song, but it is readily available through official channels if you haven't heard it and are curious. As for exactly what it was Nomura wanted Utada to write for the game, well, we'll have to discuss the final act.
Riku has learned that Kairi has lost her heart. In his desperation to save her, he accepts Maleficent's gifts of dark powers and control over the Heartless. He's grown to resent Sora and has fully resolved to save Kairi on his own terms, and so he brings her to Hollow Bastion, where Maleficent plans to use the Princesses of Heart to reveal the final keyhole and open the door to darkness. Hollow Bastion is a sight to behold, a decaying stronghold made of brick, mortar, and metal, towering over the endless expanse with the heartless insignia front and center. The climb to the top sees the player navigate in and out through an array of hallways, lifts, and overlooks, all the while contending with the strongest heartless variations yet. The sights are absolutely breathtaking, whether they be of the sheer scale of the derelict fortress, or the endless expanse of a desolate world which, despite having fallen to darkness long ago, is still bathed in the warmth of a peach sky. The score here is similarly beautiful, but unsettling, driven by a frantic piano in the key of B minor, instilling a certain dread in the listener. But even as the soundscape grows, there remains a faint glimmer of hope that it won't all be for naught. The rising falls where Sora, Donald, and Goofy land when they first arrive are a curious and serene oasis in this harrowing land, despite the castle itself looming over them. But this is also where Sora hits his lowest point. The trio intervene as Riku attempts to slay the beast, who followed Bell here through sheer force of will. But in a shocking twist, Riku successfully calls the Keyblade to him, declaring that he is the true Keyblade Master, and will be the one to save Kairi, open the door, and change the world. To add insult to injury, Donald and Goofy abandon Sora and follow their orders to stick with the Keyblade, though not without apprehension. Sora is left with a wooden sword and an injured beast, whose determination to keep fighting for Bell inspires Sora to do the same for Kairi. It's a powerful scene, both in terms of the narrative and game experience. You've been through a lot to get here and now you've had your power stripped from you. You already know that the wooden sword can't hurt Heartless and now that's the only weapon you have. Granted by this point it can hurt them, but it doesn't do much. But it's the presentation that really sells it. Flat faces aside, the cinematography, character animation, and, perhaps most significantly, the lack of music really emphasize the gravity of the situation. It's surprisingly naturalistic for a story like this, and really puts you in Sora's massive size 28s. This brief section of the game can be a little irritating, as you need to rely on magic and, more optimally, the beast to do all the work fighting enemies. That triangle button gets a good workout here. And again, it is brief, as all you need to do is navigate the castle's basement to open the front gate. But this part does help to embody the core ethos of Kingdom Hearts, an ethos that, afterwards, it pushes front and center. Sora confronts Riku alone, declaring that no matter what the darkness does to him physically, his heart will continue to persist. Riku, taking this as a challenge, launches a blast of dark energy towards his former friend, only for Goofy to protect him, with Donald quick to follow. They wouldn't betray their king, but they also wouldn't turn their backs on their friend. They've been through a lot and have become thick as thieves. With his friends by his side, Sora realizes that, despite Riku's badgering, he doesn't need a weapon. His strength doesn't come from the Keyblade. It, unironically, comes from the friends he made along the way. It's after he has this epiphany that the Keyblade abandons Riku and rematerializes in Sora's grip. In this moment, the Keyblade represents the bonds that Sora has forged on the way here. The trio proceed to clobber Riku, who retreats deeper into the castle. Is this moment schmaltzy? Yes, absolutely. It is undeniably saccharine and runs more on emotion than anything. But do you know what else tends to run more on emotion than cold logic? Disney movies and fairy tales. While it tends to be used in a derogatory way, melodrama isn't a dirty word around here. After all, the point of stories is to make an emotional connection with those who engage with them. While this can overlap with the intellectual and psychological, the weight and impact of a story always comes down to its emotional resonance. 
And this is often rooted in characters, which is why I tend to weigh their importance more heavily in my personal estimations of media. It's a personal preference, obviously, but more often than not, it's the one which has gotten me more emotionally invested in movies, books, TV shows, and yes, video games, than any other aspect. Kingdom Hearts was conceived as being about the bonds between people, that no matter how far away you are, you are always connected to those you care about. Sora's realization of exactly this is what calls the Keyblade back into his hands, even when he thinks he doesn't need it to fight. Kingdom Hearts is, in essence, a high-concept Disney fairy tale, a story meant to impart simple life lessons to those in their formative years, and as far as simple life lessons go, these are solid and are communicated earnestly. There are more fairy tale esque aspects to the story which become clear in this final act, but first, since we're on the subject of bonds and friendship, I want to take the time to discuss Riku in more detail. As I noted much, much earlier in this video, his relationship with Sora grows more antagonistic over time. Back home, they were best friends and rivals, always pushing each other to improve. They were competitive, but always in a friendly way. The only thing you could even vaguely classify as a wedge between them was Kairi, as Riku suggested that the winner of a race would share a Palpu fruit with her, which, according to old stories, would bind their destinies together. When combined with Sora's private admittance that he would like to share the fruit with her, this strongly implies a love triangle situation. But if Riku's suggestion is read as merely teasing, which, given that he did tease Sora about the Palpu at the end of the first day, was probably the intention, then one can instead read his insistence on saving Kairi himself as being an extension of his competitive nature, gradually turned hostile by Maleficent's deception. And I do mean gradually, as not only does he not completely trust her at first, but even after he starts believing her, he doesn't totally let go of the bond he shared with Sora right away. The biggest signifier of this is in Monstro, where Riku kidnaps Pinocchio, thinking that figuring out why a puppet with no heart is alive may lead to a way to save Kairi. While he does taunt Sora when they first cross paths here, he treats it more like a game and even fights alongside him to save Pinocchio from the parasite cage. David Gallagher's line delivery even hints that, despite what he tells Maleficent, he may not have actually been messing with Sora, but rather still wanted to salvage what he thought was a dying friendship. Why do you still care about that boy? He has all but deserted you for the Keyblade and his new companions, after all. I don't care about him. I was just messing with him a little. Oh really? Of course you were. It's after Maleficent gives him the ability to command the Heartless that Riku starts to get drunk on power. He's still doing it so he can save Kairi, but it's clear that he's acclimating to the role that Maleficent wants him to fill regardless of whether he realizes it. She's been manipulating him this whole time, even going so far as to have him kidnap one of the Seven Princesses, and she was the one who suggested that Riku was the true Keyblade Master, prompting him to call it away from Sora. It's a twist that comes practically out of nowhere, but as that mysterious robed figure tells Riku shortly after Sora takes it back, the Keyblade chooses those with a heart that is strong and true. Riku was resolute that he could save Kairi, which was why he was able to call it away from Sora, who hadn't yet realized that his strength comes from the bonds he's forged in his journey, and not the Keyblade itself. Riku momentarily falters and loses the Keyblade when Sora realizes this. Even if he tells himself that he's doing all of this to save Kairi, Riku has become obsessed with power. What started as desperate yearning to see the outside world, facing darkness without fear to see what lies beyond his island, has become a tragedy, turning him against his best friend and surrendering his heart to the same darkness that granted him his freedom. His lust for power results in his body being stolen by someone else. Ansem, the old sage who had disappeared when studying the Heartless, now having become the Seeker of Darkness. Earlier, I had loosely compared Sora and Riku's relationship in this story to that of Cecil and Cain in Final Fantasy IV, but it's at this point where Riku's character falls more in line with Galbez, the antagonist for most of FF4, and especially Leon from Final Fantasy II. Galbez was Cecil's brother, Theodore, whose mind had been taken over by the evil Lunarian Zemus. When that control is broken, Theodore is aghast at what he had done under Zemus's control, and resolves to end his terror personally. 
Leon, meanwhile, lost his home to the Empire and was missing from the party when Furion, Maria, and Guy woke up in Altair. He takes up the mantle of the Emperor's Dark Knight, crossing paths with the heroes on occasion, before ascending the throne after the party slays the Emperor, only to rejoin them when the Emperor rises from the depths of Hell to take him down once and for all. Obviously, none of them is a perfect analogue for Riku, but I point out these similarities to illustrate that he's more similar to the complex characters Square was known for than the more simplistic Disney characters that Sora is in line with. As a result, he's a much more compelling villain than Maleficent. His outward motivation is the same as Sora's, and he's wary of Maleficent, garnering a bit of sympathy, but it's that personal relationship and history that he has with Sora that gets you invested. You don't necessarily want to defeat Riku, you want him to wake up to what's actually going on, but by the time he understands that, it's far too late. Ansem is in the driver's seat now, and he intends to finish what Maleficent started. Up to this point, I've only mentioned Ansem, the true villain of Kingdom Hearts, very sparingly. Part of this is because he has very little presence in the narrative until the third act, previously only appearing as a mysterious robed figure spouting seemingly cryptic nonsense to Sora in the secret place on Destiny Islands. But more specifically, it's because, after he and his report are initially brought up by the Final Fantasy characters in Traverse Town, he isn't really mentioned again until he reveals that he's taken Riku's body for himself. Of course, you do gradually recover his report over the course of the story, as you defeat Maleficent and her council. At no point are the contents of the report mentioned in the story, nor do you have to read it to understand what's going on at any point, but perusing its pages does paint an interesting picture. One of a man whose insatiable curiosity and desire for knowledge led him to conduct heinous experiments to learn about the nature of the heart and the dark creatures that he formerly dubbed Heartless. It was after giving them this name that he learns that the Heartless don't actually lack hearts, but rather are a form taken by a person's heart when it's consumed by darkness. He continued to conduct experiments to learn more, which involved sacrificing countless, living people to the Heartless to understand all that he could. He created a machine to simulate the conditions in which they naturally spawn, and when it was successful, marked the artificially created Heartless with an emblem to distinguish them. It was while he was studying the Heartless that he discovered that all worlds have a heart of their own, and that the Heartless are drawn to it. The night after he opened a mysterious door within his castle and discovered the heart of his own world, there was a spectacular meteor shower that rained down a peculiar material, one which bonded easily. Soon after, a visitor arrived from another world, a king whose vessel was built of that same material, calling them Gummy Blocks. Ansem and this king spoke for hours, and of all that they discussed, the thing that intrigued him most was the mystical Keyblade, a weapon that begets legends of its wielder saving the world and plunging it into chaos. Upon learning of such a powerful weapon, Ansem thought back to the door he opened, the door he now believed opened the pathways to other worlds, and resolved to connect the Keyblade to it. His tenth and final report is the most ominous one of them all, as he reflects on his findings and muses on the implications. If the Heartless are born of darkness and people's hearts, if they seek to return to a greater heart, and they're drawn to the hearts of worlds, is the core of a world's heart the world of the Heartless? Ansem concludes his report by resolving to find out for himself, to find whoever wields the Keyblade and gather the seven princesses of heart, casting away his frail body in order to submerge himself in the deepest darkness, all in search of knowledge. It's a tragedy that plays out entirely through his writings, and by the time Ansem's presence in the story is made more concrete, it's already changed him. While in possession of Riku's body, Ansem forges a Keyblade with the power to unlock people's hearts, using the hearts of six of the princesses. He demonstrates its power by using it on Maleficent, who, despite the surge in power it grants her, is still defeated by Sora and the gang, though not without a struggle. Seriously, it can be a tough fight. But with Maleficent out of the way, there's nothing standing between Sora and Kairi, which is exactly what Ansem wants. Because unbeknownst to Sora, Kairi's heart has been inside of him this whole time. The foreshadowing for this revelation was superb. The hallucinations in the first act, Sora feeling that the castle slide in Deep Jungle was familiar, Kairi's hand twitching in response to his presence in Neverland, the flashback to her childhood, and, the most obvious clue, Kairi literally fading into Sora when he tries catching her on Destiny Islands. 
All of these clues point directly towards this reveal with varying levels of subtlety, with the first and last ones practically smacking you over the head with it, but in a way that's only apparent after the fact. Again, it's schmaltzy, but it's not like there wasn't any buildup. In fact, the entire game has been building up to this moment. Sora finally finds Kairi and learns her heart was with him the whole time, which resonates with the story's main themes. Even when she was far away, she was always with him. We learn for certain that Riku has lost his body because of his own submission to darkness. All seven princesses are here, and Ansem just needs to free Kairi's heart to open the final keyhole. Sora's already lost one friend, but he's not going to lose another, especially not when the fates of countless worlds are on the line. And so, in a direct inversion of when he first arrived here, he makes his stand. Sora! Forget it. There's no way you're taking Kairi's heart! The fight against Riku Ansem is one of the most dreaded fights in the game for countless players. He's aggressive, can hit like a truck, and will punish you for your misplays. This duel is a fantastic callback to the fights you can have with Riku back on the island at the start of the game, more so than the fight with him before he was possessed. While it isn't technically Riku anymore, Ansem still pulls out a couple of the same tactics as his host did back then. I think the reason why so many people struggle with this fight is because of how different it is from practically every other boss fight in the game. He's an agile target with specific tells and small openings. You can force an opening with the counterattack ability, provided you're good at blocking or parrying, but again, the timing is more specific than what the game had previously demanded. That isn't a criticism, by the way. I struggled with this fight a bit too in my playthroughs for this video, but I still loved it, aside from needing to let the cutscene before it play out after every loss. This is probably the best boss fight in the game, aside from the secret bosses, as it requires the player to put everything they learned about the game's movement and combat system into practice. It's a tense but very fair one-on-one -on -one duel with a lot of narrative and emotional suspense riding on it. But what really makes it a great callback is that it exhibits how Sora and Riku's journeys have changed them. Sora has grown physically and spiritually. He's a much more capable combatant now than he was back home. More importantly though, he doesn't hesitate to make a stand despite being alone here. It shows that he's embraced his own ethos from earlier, that his strength comes from the bonds he's forged, which is how he's ultimately able to beat Ansem. Riku, meanwhile, walked down a path of alienation and self-destruction, leading to him physically losing himself in his lust for power. Ansem retreats, the keyhole is unstable, and, because it's incomplete, Sora isn't able to seal it. Only Kairi can complete it, but Sora's stumped on how he can free her heart from within him, until he notices the keyblade that Ansem left behind. Sora, hold on! Wow! This is the moment when Sora became a hero. He had spent so long searching for Kairi, and now here he is, willingly giving his life to effectively restore hers without a second thought. And all she sees is his body beginning to fade away, as she tries to catch his fall, only for his light to be totally snuffed out as she tries to reach him. And this whole scene is scored to a stripped-down version of Utada's theme song for the game, a song which had been written to be about a parting of ways. When I first played this when I was 12, I was devastated. I liked Sora. I had gotten invested in him as a character. I wanted to see him save his friends. But I wasn't expecting to have my own heart torn out when he finally did. This was the first time I openly wept while playing a video game, and it still moves me, even now. It's a pivotal moment in the story that sticks the landing in every possible regard. But of course, this isn't where it all ends. The keyhole is complete, but without the keyblade, it can't be sealed. And if it isn't sealed, then Ansem will be able to access the door to darkness. Donald and Goofy are prepared to fight, but before Ansem can get too close, an apparition of Riku appears, holding Ansem back from using his body to hurt them while warning that the Heartless are coming. 
and they do start to come. In fact, you take control of a lone shadow as Kyrie, Donald, and Goofy flee the hall. You can't attack, and there's nothing you can really do but move around and jump, but it's a fun little novelty. It quickly dawns on you, however, that you're not just playing as a Heartless, you're playing as Sora's Heartless. This is something that Kairi picks up on when you catch up to her and the others, and she vows to protect him from the other shadows that begin to surround them. She embraces him as the Heartless make their move, and just as it looks like they'll both be swallowed up... Kairi, thank you. Sora! Now this is given some degree of explanation later. Sora felt himself falling deeper into darkness, losing his sense of self and so forth, but he came back from the brink when he heard Kairi's voice. Her status as a princess of heart could also be a factor in why Sora's heart and body were restored, but that's all minutia. Again, this is a fairy tale. It's a story driven by emotion, and Kazushige Nojima, who wrote the scenario from Hollow Bastion onward, clearly understood this. Just as Sora saved Kairi, Kairi has saved him. Sora has finally saved Kairi, but his work isn't over yet. The final keyhole has unleashed a torrent of powerful Heartless upon the worlds, and they're only growing stronger. He needs to go back and seal it. Kairi wants to come too, as she's been with him through everything else up to now, but Sora declines as it's too dangerous. Early on, there were considerations for making Kairi a playable character, but these ultimately wouldn't come to fruition. Which is a shame because she's absent or lifeless outside of the very beginning and the very end of the story. She isn't exactly bereft of personality, she's a bubbly romantic but also a bit headstrong and snarky, but compared to Sora and Riku she feels more like a prop. The fact that she has no agency for the bulk of the narrative especially doesn't help this. That being said, since she was never shown to be sparring with the other kids back on their island, it can be reasonably surmised that she has little to no proficiency or interest in combat, so leaving her out of the action in any capacity is understandable. Instead, she hands Sora the lucky charm she made from seashells back home, the one inspired by the stories she had heard about sailors wearing necklaces made of them in hopes of a safe journey. Don't ever forget, wherever you go, I'm always with you. The return trip to Hollow Bastion is nothing special. Fight through more powerful Heartless on the way up to the keyhole, beat the boss, and that's it. Leon and the others show up, revealing that this world was their home before it fell to darkness, and that they now plan to work on restoring it to what it once was. They and the princesses, who had been holding back the darkness while Sora's been away, also reveal that, while the worlds will be restored and everyone will go back home once Ansem is defeated, the paths between the worlds will be locked, the gummy ship won't be able to travel between them, and they'll all be isolated again. But even if they never meet again, their hearts will still be connected. Ansem is long gone though. He's absconded beyond Hollow Bastion, to where the remains of those worlds consumed by the Heartless have coalesced into a world of pure darkness. The end of the world. It's hauntingly surreal, and ominously beautiful, with a surface of scattered rock shards dotting a still sea, a deep crevasse bulging with what look like raw gummy blocks, visible remnants of worlds long consumed, and hordes upon hordes of Heartless. And to bookend the story, the world is scored to a new arrangement of Distati. The battle theme follows suit, with the sole exception of the surprise appearance of the Disney Devil himself, Chernabog, with his boss fight in the international release being accompanied by an arrangement of Night on Bald Mountain, the same composition which accompanied his first appearance in Fantasia in 1940. It's a pretty easy fight, but it also does a good job at breaking up the pace a bit. Before this confrontation, however, is the World Terminus, which houses numerous portals to all the worlds Sora has traveled to on his way here. It's implied that this is how the Heartless invades, though the fact that one of these portals leads to the Hundred Acre Wood throws this idea into question. The most intriguing of these portals is the one for Hollow Bastion, which can only be entered once but leads to a unique area not yet visited, the Laboratory. It's here where we find some sort of a machine containing hearts, and a computer terminal foreshadowing the ending. 
Passing through the door in the final rest, the same door from Sora's dreams, brings the trio to the Destiny Islands, but the illusion doesn't last, as it begins to crumble and distort. Ansem, now fully in control of Riku's body, pontificates on the nature of darkness and how it's the true essence of the heart, and Billy Zane gives a phenomenally charismatic performance. He is, truly, the strongest member of the entire cast, and I would very much like to hear his parts of the possession dialogue isolated to just hear more of him in this role. Sora rebuts Ansem, saying that, no matter how deep the darkness is, there will always be an unyielding light. Incensed at what he sees as ignorance, Ansem goes on the offensive, summoning a Dark Guardian to aid him. It's a fairly easy fight, though the Guardian's possession is annoying if you fail to avoid its swipe. The second fight with him after fighting a dark side is a solo battle, and he does have a couple new tricks, but it's still nothing too crazy. It's after soloing him that Ansem starts getting serious. He plunges the trio into the Dark Abyss, where the door to darkness, the Great Heart, Kingdom Hearts, awaits and he intends to open the door and conquer all worlds with the power of darkness. He connects himself to a gargantuan, fleshy battleship, the World of Chaos, in preparation to realize this goal, casting Donald and Goofy away to parts unknown. Alone in the deepest darkness, Sora begins to plummet into the abyss, until… Giving up already? Come on, Sora. I thought you were stronger than that. Riku's body may have been stolen and his heart fall into darkness, but he's still a part of Sora's heart. He and Kairi will always be with him. It helps that they're also represented by a couple of his Keyblades. The World of Chaos is a series of fairly uninteresting bouts with different parts of the ship, which upon their destruction open portals to dark rooms containing a squad of Heartless and a fleshy power core. Donald and Goofy are found in the last two, and after destroying the central core, Ansem emerges for one final bout. The fight with him at the start of this sequence is only hard if you're on expert mode. It's the only time I've ever seen him spawn smaller mobs to keep you busy. On normal, he's a cakewalk, but with Donald and Goofy, the last round with him is much more manageable on the harder difficulty, assuming you've actually taken the time to adjust their AI. I've kinda skimmed around it, but this final gauntlet, despite not being all that engaging in terms of raw gameplay, is suitably epic and grandiose. It helps that, again, Destati is the battle track maintaining the bookends. But even as his ship is destroyed, Ansem, with his last ounce of strength, beckons Kingdom Hearts to open and bestow upon him the ultimate power of darkness. Sora, however, realizes what Kingdom Hearts truly is. I know now, without a doubt, Kingdom Hearts is light! <laughs> The door of darkness, tied by two keys, the door to darkness, to seal the light. None shall pass but shadows, returning to the darkness. The lab computer gave a pertinent clue to how this was going to end for Ansem, who is seemingly vaporized by the light that escapes from beyond the door. But our heroes can't just leave the door open. Thousands of Heartless, those that had returned to the Great Heart, as suggested by the lab computer, are stirring inside, waiting to escape. The door won't budge. All hope seems lost. But then... Don't give up! Come on, Sora! Together we can do it! With Ansem defeated, Riku's body is now his own again. His heart, like those of the encroaching Heartless, had returned to the Great Heart, and he ended up here, on the other side of a door which can only be passed by shadows. He couldn't escape even if he wanted to. So here he is, ready to try and make amends for his horrible mistakes the only way he can. And he's not alone in there either, as those Heartless that get too close to the door are slain by someone else. Someone who went on a journey of his own to ensure that the door can be sealed. Everyone is reunited, but not under the best circumstances. They all know that this is a temporary reunion, that once they seal the door, they'll be torn apart once again. But the king is quick to assure Sora that there will always be a door to the light, and that they'll all meet again. Again, the score is what really makes this scene. It's not overly triumphant, nor melancholic. It's reassuring, but also bittersweet. So that's it then. Ansem is gone, the door is closed, and while Riku and Mickey had to stay on the other side, at least we know they're okay. 
the worlds will be restored, and everyone will go back home, including Kairi, who Sora sees, confused, nearby. They were only reunited recently, but now they have to part ways once again. you said before? I'm always with you too. I'll come back to you. I promise. I know you will. This ending had me bawling as a kid. After all Sora had gone through to save Kairi and dissuading her from coming with him again for her safety, the thought of them being torn apart again absolutely gutted me. Of course, it's under much better circumstances this time, as he knows that she's going back home and that she'll be safe there while he searches for Riku. I understood this even back then, but it doesn't make it sting any less. As an adult, it still gets me a bit teary-eyed for the same reasons as when I was young, but I'm still just as in awe of the visuals as when I first saw it. The imagery of shooting stars rising from beyond the shoreline as they return to their rightful places in the sky is gorgeous, and the quality of the CGI still holds up well today. Tetsuya Nomura had this whole ending sequence planned out early on, and the cornerstone of it is Utada's music. He had specified that the track be about a parting of ways, as I mentioned earlier, but an optimistic one. And it works perfectly, as it supports the simple but impactful visual storytelling. Kairi visits the old seeker place and notices that Sora added a palpu fruit to the etchings they had done of each other as kids, and she returns the gesture in kind, before quickly fading to black. Their feelings are mutual, and now she longs for the day that her hero will return to her. The credits have some scenes of what various characters get up to afterward, including Cloud reuniting with the rest of the Final Fantasy cast in Hollow Bastion, but we also get a little epilogue after the credits, teasing that Sora, Donald, and Goofy's adventures will continue, with a reprise of Hand in Hand playing them off. And so concludes Kingdom Hearts. I will readily admit that I am biased when it comes to this game. While I didn't play it when it originally came out, I did start playing it in my formative years and love it to bits. It's not a perfect game. The camera is often a bother, it can occasionally fall into button-mashing territory, and the story can be a bit overly saccharine at times. But it knows what it is, and hardly pretends it's anything more than a fairy tale about a boy who saves the world with the power of friendship. It's earnest, and there's nothing wrong with that. Every time I play Kingdom Hearts, I find something new to appreciate. A little design quirk or hidden chest that eluded me on my countless previous playthroughs. Maybe I'll try a different build and experiment with a new playstyle. I haven't tried a Rod playthrough, so there's something right there. Maybe I'll keep making new gummy ships and see how fast I can clear a route. Or try and see all the alternative versions of certain cutscenes. Pardon the wording, but Kingdom Hearts just has a lot of heart. But these days, if I'm jumping back into it, it's not through the original North American release, because as nostalgic as I am for it, I recognize its shortcomings. But more importantly, by the end of 2002, it was already out of date. On December 26, 2002, a mere nine months after Kingdom Hearts was released in Japan, and three months after its international debut, an updated version of the game would be released in Japan. Titled Kingdom Hearts Final Mix, this new version featured all of the new content and changes from the international versions, along with a bevy of other tweaks and additions, such as new abilities, a new beginner difficulty mode that starts the player off with additional stat-boosting items at the beginning of the game, new color palettes for most Heartless, the ability to skip previously watched cutscenes, a completely overhauled synthesis track, new cutscenes, including a new secret ending, two new Keyblades, and a brand new secret boss exclusive to this version. 
To top it all off, like Final Fantasy X International released at the beginning of the year, the dialogue in Final Mix is not the original Japanese voice track, but the English dub. Unlike FF10 International, however, there is no option to change the text to English. It's all in Japanese. I don't recall exactly how I first heard about this definitive edition of the game when I was a kid. It may have been through perusing the cutscene archives on khvids.net, which at the time had the Final Mix exclusive cutscenes in their own sections. I do remember feeling back then that there wasn't all that much new added to this version, at least when compared to the version that was released here in North America. We already had most of those new bosses, the new colors for enemies seemed pointless, the new cutscenes were mostly fluff, and the new Keyblades, I felt, were kinda lame. Of course, this was long before I actually played Final Mix for myself, experienced firsthand how these things were integrated, and, most importantly, understood just how much of the game had been expanded. I didn't know about the new abilities at the time, but they actually make the game more interesting and easier to play. Sliding Dash is especially appreciated, as it quickly closes the gap on enemies a certain distance away with a single attack. Slapshot helps speed up combos with how fast it hits. Leaf Bracer prevents you from taking damage while casting Cure. Between these and other abilities, as well as turning Sora transparent as the camera gets closer to him, the gameplay feels smoother and a bit faster, promoting a slightly more aggressive playstyle. But this aggression won't get you very far if you plan on completing the Synthesis list and getting Ultima Weapon. Not only has the list been extended with new items, but new materials have been added that are only dropped by new Heartless scattered around the world. And getting them to drop the goods isn't always easy. Most of them have certain requirements that need to be met for them to have a chance of dropping their rare Synthesis materials. Sniper Wilds have to be handled one at a time without the group being alerted to your presence. You have to carefully watch where the real Black Ballad ends up in a line of clones. You need to get at least 100 hits on a Pink Agaricus while you have it frozen with time magic to guarantee its rare drop. They're all intriguing and require much more preparation and effort than it took to synthesize everything in the original version, but they can definitely be frustrating. The two new Keyblades, unlocked for beating the Ice Titan and Sephiroth, act as quasi-substitutes for the Ultima weapon, depending on whether you want to focus more on magic or melee. Diamond Dust has the same strength modifier as the basic Kingdom Key, but it's the only Keyblade in the game that boosts Sora's max MP by 3. One Winged Angel, meanwhile, has a long reach and a ridiculously high critical hit bonus, but it reduces max MP by 2, is only as strong as the Fairy Harp, and has a poor chance of actually landing a critical hit. The Ultima Weapon, which got a strength boost to this go-around, is still the best option overall, but the new Keyblades do have their use cases, especially Diamond's Dust. The new cutscenes are… well, just what I thought they were when I was a kid. They're mostly fluff. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that the two scenes focusing on Riku hurt the storytelling a bit by cluing the player in on him joining Maleficent and being behind the door to darkness. They're not that big a deal, but they definitely don't feel like they're supposed to be here. The first one more so than the second. The flashbacks of Sora and Riku's friendship as they're closing the door, though? A bit excessive, but ultimately fine in my book. They also added a confrontation between Cloud and Sephiroth after you've beaten the latter, confirming that he was who Cloud had been searching for. It's an alright scene that, unfortunately, doesn't really go anywhere. Interestingly, the staff wanted to include Tifa Lockhart from Final Fantasy VII as another secret boss, feeling she'd be fun to fight because of her combat style, but due to time constraints, they had to pick between her and Sephiroth, and the latter ultimately won out. Shame, but I can understand why they went with him. However, Sephiroth is no longer at the top of the pecking order in terms of secret bosses, because in the Castle Chapel at Hollow Bastion, a mysterious portal has appeared which leads to the same area where Maleficent was fought in her dragon form. Only this time, a mysterious figure in a black coat confronts Sora and company, someone whose dialogue is only communicated via unstable text on a black backdrop. And Sora and Goofy's spoken dialogue in this scene is all recycled from other cutscenes. Who are you? I am Sam? What's that supposed to mean? What are you talking about? Wait, what are you- He passes through Sora, causing him to experience a rush of memories, and though he's familiar with the name Ansem, he doesn't explain who he is or why he's here. Sora reminds him of someone, though he remarks that the boy is incomplete, and cordially invites himself to test Sora's strength. It's… eerie, and defeating him yields little in the way of answers. 
He tells a confused Sora that he'll understand who he is and what he's talking about in time, referring to himself as a mere shell before fading away, impressed with the young Keyblade Master's abilities. I would hope he's impressed because he's easily the most frenetic boss in the entire game, a true test of everything you've learned, even more so than Sephiroth. His boss track, Disappeared, is similarly far removed from the rest of the soundtrack. Dissonance and discordance are rife in this track, similar to how his simple appearance contrasts Ansem's, whose boss theme is subtly recalled here. But there is a bit more linking this enigmatic man to Ansem. In addition to an experience necklace, he also drops one of the three new entries that were added to Ansem's report in Final Mix. The first two are dropped by Kurt Zisa and Sephiroth, and they predictably expand on the first ten entries from the original release, but not in the ways one may expect. Report 11 is mainly implying that Ansem was the one who sent Kyrie out into the Great Beyond, which is interesting in and of itself, but 12 and 13 do more to tickle the brain. The heart of one of his test subjects retains its memories and refuses to transform into a heartless despite their body being long gone. This leads him to ponder what actually happens to the body when the heart is separated from it, whether the body is actually dead if it has no heart but retains a soul. He theorizes that the body would go to another world between light and darkness, but because the essence of a person is with their heart, then whatever the body is can't be the same person that they once were, because that person should now be a heartless. They can't really exist, as he puts it. And so he dubs that which remains but should not exist, nobody. Of course, with no further explanation, and the black coat the mysterious figure wore being the same as those shown in the secret endings, it's pretty apparent that this is all set up for a potential sequel. And with just the information provided here, I could draw up potential theories that players may have had all the way back then, but I think that's best saved for another time. All in all, Final Mix is a much bigger expansion of the original game than my younger self thought it was, and it is definitely worth playing over it. However, there was one small problem. It wasn't released outside of Japan. For nearly two decades now, I've heard whispers and rumors to the effect of Sony not allowing re-releases without a certain amount of additional content or changes to be sold in North America, but never have I seen an actual source to back this up. Moreover, there's the question of how exactly one would quantify that sort of thing, which would be an entire conversation unto itself. Regardless, I did actually import a copy of Final Mix to play for myself, and it wasn't nearly as hard to play as one would think, despite the language barrier. There are a few tells that can help clue English speakers in on the effects of certain items and abilities pretty easily. But as of September 2013, this was no longer necessary, as Final Mix would finally make its way outside Japan for the first time as part of the compilation release, Kingdom Hearts HD 1.5 Remix, for the PlayStation 3. And it would make its way to the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, PC, and Nintendo Switch via cloud streaming in the years to follow. This was how the vast majority of non-Japanese players experienced Final Mix, but it also included a few additional changes to make it a bit more palatable to modern sensibilities and bring it more in line with the controls of later releases. Namely, the camera was pulled back a bit with control remapped to the right analog stick. Context-sensitive actions were assigned to the triangle button, like reaction commands in later titles. The fourth slot on the command menu was made the permanent home of the summon command, and, starting with the PS4 version, the frame rate was increased to 60 frames per second. This initially caused some issues when this version was released, but they have since been patched. Aside from no longer having the option to navigate the command menu with the right stick, this version is great. Easily the definitive way to play the original Kingdom Hearts. The better camera is a worthwhile trade-off for the occasional claw grip, and the newly recorded soundtrack, a few tracks aside, sounds terrific. But I'm not really a fan of the new models used for Sora and Ansem. The former's hair is too light compared to the original, and I'm not big on the mascara look for him, while the latter looks really bright and too smooth in my opinion. They, alongside Riku's model, were all recycled from Dream Drop Distance, likely to bring them more in line with how the characters look in later titles. That wasn't all they had to do to put together this remaster either. The original source code for the game was lost some time ago, and so large swaths of the game had to be remade from scratch. If you want to hear that more often in future videos, then click the subscribe button. 
It is great that this game and the rest of the series are so readily available on your platform of choice, considering the long and winding road fans have been on in that regard, and I would never tell anyone curious to try the original PS2 version over the HD version, but sometimes I will boot up the version I grew up with to get a good nostalgia hit. Because while the HD version is far and away the best way to play, I still have warm feelings for what we got all the way back in 2002. In an interview with Electronic Gaming Monthly, Tetsuya Nomura stated that Square had fairly reserved expectations for Kingdom Hearts in Japan, hoping to sell around 500,000 units. It nearly hit that goal within its first three days on store shelves, selling over 411,000 copies and debuting at number two on the sales charts. It would briefly claim the top spot for a week in April, and would sell nearly 800,000 units before dropping out of the top 30 in mid-July. This drew the ire of Capcom's Shinji Mikami, who during a radio interview expressed his frustration that Kingdom Hearts was handily outselling the recently released remake of the original Resident Evil for GameCube. These strong sales were accompanied by equally enthusiastic critical reception, with Famitsu giving it a score of 36 out of 40 and inducting Kingdom Hearts into their Platinum Hall of Fame. Sentiments were largely the same in the West, though the one consistent element to their reviews was bewilderment at how such a concept came together so well. Kingdom Hearts was showered with 8s and 9s out of 10, and plenty of recommendations for what was ultimately a fun romp that ended up being more complex than its Mickey Mouse veneer had many suspecting. And enough readers would heed those recommendations despite such apprehensions, leading to Kingdom Hearts being the third best-selling game in North America in October, behind Grand Theft Auto Vice City at number one and NBA Live 2003 at the second spot, and crossing the one million unit mark in North America over the holidays, earning itself a greatest hits label. By the end of March, it had sold over 3.3 million copies worldwide, which would grow to 4 million by March 2004. And in September 2007, Square Enix would announce that the game had sold more than 5.9 million copies in total, including Final Mix, cementing it as one of the best-selling games on the PlayStation 2. Moreover, it's still often regarded as one of the best games the console has to offer. But the real signifier of Kingdom Hearts' legacy is the franchise that would follow in its wake. Even now, over two decades later, we're still getting new entries in the series, be they smartphone spin-offs or full-fledged numbered sequels on home consoles. But as the series has progressed and the narrative has spun an increasingly complex yarn, the original game still garners a certain reverence from both longtime fans who are still keeping up with it, like myself, and those who had checked out from what they call Nomura's Wild Ride long ago. I have my own thoughts on how the series has evolved over time, which I'll divulge as we continue with this retrospective series, but suffice it to say that Kingdom Hearts 1 remains a unique experience, even among the franchise it spawned. With Kingdom Hearts achieving overwhelming international critical and commercial success, it was inevitable that Tetsuya Nomura would be given the go-ahead to move forward with a follow-up. The first-time director had already inserted allusions to various ideas he had for a potential sequel in the secret endings produced for the first game, and now he was faced with the challenge of crystallizing those vague concepts into a proper continuation. 
And so work would begin on a sequel post-haste, with the game being officially announced in September 2003 at the Tokyo Game Show. But it would also be at TGS where another title would be announced, one taking place in between the original game and its follow-up, which would see Sora plunged into the jaws of oblivion, new villains would begin to play their cards, and our hero would be faced with the sting of lost memories.